Hey everyone, it's the Drive to School podcast. I'm Pastor Goodman and uh, joining me again today is David Zills, the great apologist. How are you doing today, David? Doing all right. Harrison, how are you doing? I'm not too bad. It's 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 turning into fall. Uh, we talked about it last time. Um, um, it's hard to go wrong. Got my coffee, got my cozy. Life's real good. Yeah, it's 60 degrees out, which is the coolest it's been since spring here. So got to gotta dress warmly for, for work today. Fair enough. All right. So we've been talking about whether or not we can trust the Bible. And I mean, it's it's an important question, right? So kind of sum up where we were last time. Yeah. So I think the overarching theme that I think is really important is emphasizing what faith is and that faith is not a blind leap in the dark um, because that's how you get cults and like drinking the Kool-Aid, like literally, you know, that, you know, someone says, trust me, I, I heard a vision from God that's you know, you, you should test that and not, not just go along with everything because there are charlatans and, you know, as a Christian, we think there are deceiving spirits. And so you should test things. And so I think a better definition of faith is trust that's earned by God because he has a track record of being reliable and being faithful. And so that track record is in history and we can examine it to see if it's been preserved reliably. And that's where apologetics comes in. You know, can we have confidence that what we have in the Bible, the account of God's faithfulness, the things he's done, the things he said, can we have confidence that they're that they're real and that they're not fairy tales? And so last time we focused on kind of the first part, I, I kind of think of historical apologetics as a uh, tracing backward. Um, So last time we started from today and we went back to the original writings and we said, is what we have today what was originally written? And this is sometimes known as textual criticism, um, also known as lower criticism or the bibliographic test, lots of names for the same concept. But the basic idea is, is what we have today the same thing that was originally written? And the reason that's an important question is because we don't have the original writings we have copies of copies of copies. And so the question is, was that copying process reliable? So, you know, a one way to sum up textual criticism is did the copyists keep the story the same? And so the way you answer that is by looking at kind of the paper trail or the manuscript record and saying, basically asking three questions about the manuscripts we have. The first is, how many manuscripts do we have? How many copies of the original writings? Obviously, the more is better. The more data you have, the more confidence you can have about your conclusions. Second question is, how early, how far back to the original writings are the manuscripts? If there's a big time gap, there's this big unknown period where we have no record of what happened in the copying process. And so that's not a good thing. Um, It can leave room for doubt, but if there's a short time gap, we can have more confidence um, that, that there there's not some missing piece that we lost in the copying process. And then the third question and final question is how consistent are the manuscripts? And there are always going to be discrepancies because copyists aren't perfect. But the question is, are they substantive? Most of the discrepancies in the New Testament manuscripts are things like spelling errors or word order, which doesn't affect meaning in in the Greek language, at least New Testament Greek. So, um, you know, those don't affect meaning. And then the second question is where the discrepancies are substantive and they do affect meaning. Is there a way to figure out which version was the correct version and which one was a distortion. It turns out a lot of the times you can do that. Um, And so the verdict with the New Testament is that it's actually, uh, we can have the most confidence in the preservation of the text of the New Testament than any other ancient document. We have by far more manuscripts than any other ancient document. Many of them go back very early, especially in comparison with some ancient documents where the first copy we have is hundreds of years after the fact. And none of the discrepancies, they're very, the majority of them don't affect meaning. The ones that do can often be resolved and what's left, nothing affects a a substantial Christian doctrine. So really there's no part of Christianity that's in doubt because of copy error, because of the copying process of these manuscripts. And so that's lower criticism, textual criticism, or the bibliographic test. And basically that's not super controversial where most of the controversy, where most of the controversy comes is 
going backward from the original writings and we say, did the original writers get the story right? And so that's, I think, where we should head next. Right, because I, I guess it's it's one thing to be able to say, you know, I've got a copy of the Mona Lisa and so I've never been to, to Paris to see the original. Um, but I, if you can look at, you know, 50,000 copies of the Mona Lisa and they're all pretty much the same, you can be pretty, pretty sure you're looking at the same thing they're looking at uh, in the Louvre. Um, but what about the claims that they're making? Because like there is this part of, of people that just wants to say, no, they're talking about miracles. They, they made it up. They got it wrong. They were misinformed. Pick something. But this just simply cannot be true. Yeah. So I think that's important. Um, you know, we talked about the manuscript study being called lower criticism. When you talk about the original writings and did they get their sources right? Did they get their information right? That's sometimes called higher criticism. And there's been a lot of controversy theologically about higher criticism. Um, but what I'll say is that the, the, the questions asked by higher criticism, you know, did the original authors get the story right? It, it all revolves around that. That's a good question. Yeah. Um, there have been a lot of liberal theologians who have taken faulty methods and done a lot to contradict the reliability of the New Testament. But um so, so there are all sorts of theories that are proposed. You know, maybe it was a legend. That's a popular one. Maybe we don't know who wrote the original documents, and so we can't have confidence of, that they relied on reliable sources. Um, all, all sorts of things. You know, miracles is a big objection, which is curious because a lot of ancient documents have miracle claims in them. It's not unique to the Bible. And so it's a little bit of a double standard to say we can get history from reading about Alexander the Great, even though those accounts have miracle claims in them, but we can't when it comes to Jesus. But I think I think the topic of miracles is a huge topic. Probably several conversations down the road could be left to address that. But I think just focusing on, you know, how, how do we go about assessing, you know, the, the reliability of ancient documents as they were originally written? I think that's probably a good place to start. Right. Um, because at the end of the day, if the thing is true, then you have to deal with whether or not you believe it. But let's let's figure out whether or not the thing is true first. Right. 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 So a lot of it, it comes down to um, evaluating witnesses. So the, the we have written testimony in ancient documents and we want to say, are these reliable witnesses? So it turns out the questions you ask as a historian are very similar to the questions you ask, like when in a court of law, when you're or as a juror. So there have been a lot of people who have been experts in criminal investigation who have looked at the Bible and they've said, oh, wow, my skill set in criminal investigation, evaluating testimony, evaluating the reliability of witnesses is transferable to asking, are the New Testament witnesses reliable? And so some examples of that would be like Lee Strobel. He was an atheist, an investigative journalist, and came to investigate the Bible objectively as he would any any case he was studying and came to the conclusion that it was true. And now he's written, you know, tons of books explaining his thought process and what he's learned about, you know, why we can have confidence in this. Uh, you know, another example would be Jay Warner Wallace. He was a cold case detective, also an atheist. And one of his friends gave him a Bible and he thought, well, I guess I'll read it to be informed. And he did. And he was like, wait a minute, this sounds like testimony reading the Gospels and it's testimony from a long time ago. This is the same thing I deal with in cold cases where the case has gone dry. And now I'm trying to evaluate testimony after the fact. And he ended up becoming a Christian and is now an apologist. So so this is the kind of thing that we you can apply tools to the New Testament that you would to any other testimony. So we're not assuming it's reliable. We're not assuming it's inspired. We're just treating it objectively. And that's kind of where you want to launch. That's, that makes sense. And I mean, honestly, it's it's a wonderful gift that God would give us in, in having an ordinary book, even that it would also be his true and very word. I mean, Jesus physically rose from the dead, and we're hanging our entire faith upon this one fact. Paul says, if Christ has not been raised from the dead, your faith is in vain. And, and so that Christ physically entered this creation, died and rose in history, not in, in my heart or my feelings, but in history. We also have then his word that that exists in history, uh, that, that, we, that we can actually 
start to check up on how these things work with the same means that we would do anything else. God works through means. And so these means then actually lend him credibility. We, we don't just nor to, sort of need to say, well, I believe that Jesus rose in my heart. And if we found his tomb and we found his body in there, I would still believe it in my heart because, well, then we would be above all else to be pitied, says Paul. Right. Yeah. So there's the sense that we can test it objectively and it's not, you know, it's not against faith, but it actually can reinforce faith, mm -hmm. um, you know, because if God is faithful and if he is credible, he wouldn't want to deceive us, you know. So, um, yeah, so the, I think there are three questions that are worth asking when you look at ancient testimony. Um, th there have been lots of criteria. Lee Strobel has his criteria. You know, there was a Harvard legal expert who wrote about this, you know, lo a long time ago, a um, hundred years or something like that named Simon Greenleaf. He had his criteria, but they all boil down to basically three things. One is who wrote the document. If we don't know who wrote the document, it's not impossible to evaluate their credibility, but it can be harder. If you know the person, you can know things about that person from other recorded history, and that's easier to evaluate their credibility. So the first thing is the identity of the authors. The second thing is, did they know the truth? You know, did they have access to the truth or was this something that they maybe was hearsay or legend? How, how close to the events were they? And then the third question is, did, were they honest about what they knew? You know, there could be, maybe they were writing fiction. They weren't even writing a historical genre. They were writing mythology and they, they, they weren't even trying to tell the truth. Or maybe they were trying to fabricate a story, you know, it was a hoax or conspiracy. So uh, I think these are the three questions. Who, who are the authors? Did they have access to the truth? And did they honestly communicate what they knew? Um, so when we apply that to the New Testament, the authorship of the four Gospels, let's focus on those, is actually strictly anonymous. So what do I mean? I mean, we all say Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But if you look at Paul's letters, he signed them. He said, I, Paul, you know, he, he, he signed them. The, the documents, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the author never comes out and says who they are. Um, so strictly speaking, they're anonymous documents. So that could, you know, cause anxiety, like, oh, we don't know who wrote these documents. But the early church was actually not confused about this. So we have numerous quotations from the first two centuries that say, Mark wrote Mark, Matthew wrote Matthew, Luke wrote Luke, and Acts, and John wrote John. Um, so, um, and we could get into those quotations, but uh, they're there, they're there's multiple attestation from multiple sources saying we know who wrote these documents. It's the traditional authorship. There's a reason why people believe that these people wrote these documents. Second of all, in every titled manuscript found archaeologically, you never find the Gospel of Matthew with a title saying the Gospel of Jude. You know, we never find the text of that we would recognize as the Gospel of Matthew, but it's ascribed to somebody else. It, whenever there's a name on the document, it's the same name, and it's the name we have today. So there's a lot of unanimity. The early church was unanimous, struggling with words about who about who wrote these documents. There really wasn't a counter theory. Um, and if you look at the 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 people that were as, that were assigned to authorship to these books, there wouldn't have been a lot of incentive to make it up. Um, if you wanted to give, if you wanted to say someone authored this book and look, it's credible because it was somebody important, you would pick someone like Peter or James or maybe Paul. But math, it, John was prominent, so that that's actually an exception, and that's that's the gospel that receives the most skepticism today. Although I think the tides are turning in biblical criticism, but Matthew, Luke, and Mark were no names. Um, comparatively speaking, Mark and Luke weren't even apostles. And so, right. so there's very little to um, very little reason to think that this was something that the early church made up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is this is not a great sort of pseudonym to, to lend credibility to your story that that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. So we know who the authors were. So then we can go to the next questions, which are, 
did they have access to the truth? And the answer to that is pretty straightforward. John and Matthew were apostles. They lived with Jesus. So they were eyewitnesses to the events. So did they know the facts about Jesus' life? Well, they, they experienced them firsthand. So it wasn't legend or hearsay or the telephone game. You know, they were eyewitnesses. What about Mark and Luke? Well, Mark was said to have, by the early church, to have been a companion of Peter and he just wrote down what Peter preached. And Peter was an eyewitness. Um, so although Mark may not have been an eyewitness, he had access to eyewitness testimony. And the early church, you know, was insistent that he reliably recorded what Peter said. Um, and even J. Warner Wallace, that cold case detective, he looked at the Gospel of Mark from the standpoint of some tools that he learned as a detective, and he he saw internally the way it was written, just the text itself, without any other evidence from other writers from ancient times. He saw that, wow, you know, this, this is written in a way that a witness would say if they had access to Peter's testimony. So there's internal evidence as well as external evidence. And then Luke, um, the early church was unanimous that Luke was a companion of Paul. And Paul even says in 2 Timothy that Luke was with him. Luke, in the Gospel of Acts, sometimes switches into the first person. Instead of saying, they did this, he says, we did this. So he puts himself in, in the story. And so Luke had access to Paul, and Paul was either an eyewitness um, or he had access to eyewitness testimony. Um, he checked his story against the apostles who lived with Jesus. If you look at Galatians one and two, um, and so the fact is, these this is testimony that comes first from firsthand experience. It's not hearsay, right? And we talk a lot about the twelve apostles, but there are also the seventy-two that that uh, the, the disciples of Jesus. Um, and I've I've read that both uh, Mark for sure and also likely Luke uh, were were members of the seventy-two that were sort of sent out by Jesus to go and proclaim uh, to the kingdom. Um, and uh, that they sort of submit themselves under the apostles as well. Uh, there's even sort of like one of my favorite little tidbits in Mark uh, when Jesus is, is arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane um, and, and um, somebody who, who shall remain nameless uh, is so scared that he tries to run away. And when they try and the, the guards try and grab him, they grab his cloak and, and his cloak falls off. And so he ends up running away butt naked. Um, that, that this is Mark sort of like placing himself into this story in a way that, that he's, he doesn't want to, take away from uh, this. And, and you can see the shame that that's sort of there. But at the same time, it's one of those details that it's, 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 you're right. It's, it's a witness sort of telling the story as, as they, they, they witnessed it. Yes. Yeah. So, so yeah. And there have been um, biblical scholars recently in the last um, 30 years who have looked at just the, analyzed the text as it is without reference to the church fathers and the testimony of the early church and have also found clues, like you mentioned, that this, this, this has the marks of eyewitness testimony. Um, and so then the third question is, were they honest about what they knew um, or did they make it up? And so the first question is, did they have access to the truth or were they deceived? Second, or the the other question is, were they honest about what they knew or were they deceivers? And so um, the big counter argument to the fact that the early church made this up, particularly the apostles, because the early church always referred back to apostolic testimony, the people who claimed to be the eyewitnesses. The biggest counter argument that this was a hoax was that, first of all, they had nothing to gain. You look at the things that that motivate people to make up stories and none of those motivations are present. You know, was it sex? Well, these people preached a very strict sexual ethic and all by all records lived up to it. Um, was it power? Well, they were literally the scum of the earth and despised by everyone and persecuted. They were kind of a, a no name movement for 300 years. So there was no power and then money. And, you know, a lot of the apostles, you, from what we know, did not gain anything, but lived pretty poor lives as missionaries and, you know, were beaten or homeless or a lot of things like that. So there's no positive motivation to make this up. But on the other hand, there's a lot of negative motivation, because if you look at the persecution that is present through almost, you know, whether it's a non-Christian sources about the early church or Christian sources outside the Bible or the Bible's testimony itself, there was persecution. These these people, the apostles were risking their lives. And so kind of the argument goes, the, the, the classic argument is who would die for a lie? 
knowing it's a lie. So you might die for a lie. People die for things that could be lies. You know, you look at, we were, we just passed September 11th, you know, we could say that um, the terrorists who flew the planes into the Twin Towers, they sacrificed their lives for Islam, but perhaps Islam was a lie. And that's, mm -hmm. that may be true, but the difference is those terrorists believed Islam secondhand, not based on their own experience. The difference with the apostles is because they claim to be eyewitnesses, if it was a lie, they would have known it was a lie. They were in a position to know the truth. And so the question again is who would die for a lie knowing that it's a lie? So when you combine the fact that they were claimed to be eyewitnesses, and second of all, that they had a, nothing to gain and a lot to lose, we can have a lot of confidence that these documents are reliable witnesses to the events they describe. That makes sense. Um, so whatever it was that they were doing, uh, they never took it back. And it's not just that they risked their lives. Uh, we, we have a, a fairly reliable uh, piece of history and sort of testimony among the church that the apostles minus John were all martyred in, in some pretty creative ways. Yeah, that's uh, there's definitely a lot of records recording martyrdoms. Um, there's a book by Sean McDowell called The Fate of the Apostles, which was really helpful for me because one critique of that argument that all the apostles were martyred is that some of the sources are could be legendary and aren't that reliable the sources that describe the martyrdom and i think that's true in a lot of cases it may they may have been martyred they may not have been but some of them there's actually strong historical evidence so peter paul james the brother of john james the brother of jesus um, there's a there's pretty strong historical testimony that they were they were martyred and then for thomas there's a good historical case that can be made that he was martyred actually in india Interesting. If you study the Apostle Thomas, that there's a the there are multiple sources that describe him as a missionary to India and possibly Southeast Asia. You know, the apostles really took it seriously when Jesus said, "You will be my witnesses to the ends of the world." Um, but the point isn't whether they were actually martyred. The point is whether they were willing to be martyred. Because if that willingness was there, that shows that you know, to put it poignantly, martyrs and hoaxers or deceivers aren't made of the same kind of stuff, you know? Right. And even if it was fiction, uh, you, you can sort of change the intent, but but still not the, the result and say, well, okay, because they, they wrote a, a short story of a fiction um, that they're going to, well, then you recant. You, you say, I made it up. This isn't true. I'm very sorry. Um, that, there's no evidence that, that anybody ever stepped away from this. Yeah, I think it was, uh, mm, who's the the fellow, uh, the prison fellowship guy, Chuck Colson. Mm -hmm. um, Chuck Colson was actually part of Watergate mm -hmm. um, and went to prison for it. And I ended up becoming a Christian and founded um, a number of ministries that continue to this day. But the way he put it was in Watergate, 12 of the most powerful men in the world could not keep a secret for very long. There's no way that 12 of the least powerful men in the world 12 plus um, in the first century could have kept a secret that long when there was so much pressure telling them not to spread the story. Um, so yeah, there's, there's not a lot of reason to doubt the sincerity of the, the people that were the initial witnesses to who Jesus was. Right. So we can talk about the claims they're making, but it's, it's really, really hard to call into question that they saw it, that they meant what they said. Yeah. And yeah, I think, yeah. So when we look at the credibility of the, the, the original founders of Christianity, those who claim to know the story firsthand, um, if we evaluate them the way we evaluate any other witnesses and say a criminal case, a cold case, whatever, um, I think we can have a lot of confidence that what we have today is not just what was originally written, but what was originally written is what they actually experienced. That makes sense. That's that's a lot to swallow for just one day. Let's maybe uh, leave it here and we'll pick up uh, next time. What do you think? That sounds great. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you. Have a good one. You too.